This is Guar, and you're listening to Cigar City Radio. Welcome to Cigar City Radio, episode number 41. I'm your host, Randy Ojeda, and making the magic happen, Mr. Jason Solanez. I'll have one order of please. (laughs) (laughs) Why would you even order that? It's tasty. Is it? Yeah. You You know know from firsthand experience? Yeah, I eat my own. Oh, God. More than I needed to know. You're welcome. All around. You're welcome. For more episodes, head to CigarCityRadio.com or subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or whatever your favorite podcast app is. Just search for Cigar City Radio. You can also connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. And on all those networks, our username is Cigar City Radio. This episode is all about Vans Warp Tour. We were lucky enough to attend Vans Warp Tour at Vinoy Park in St. Petersburg where we got to see one of the bands that we managed, the Fantastic Plastics, who were on the first half of Van's Warp Tour. And we wanted to give a big thanks to everybody that came to see the Fantastic Plastics. They had a great audience at their at their set. Everybody was digging it, dancing, enjoying it, bought a lot of merch. So thank you for supporting TFP, the Fantastic Plastics. And shout out to Warp Tour and the entire Warp Tour crew. Shout out to... Uh, Kevin Lyman and shout out to Danielle, the press manager, for hooking us up at the press tent, letting us hang out and interview all these bands that we talked to today. It was a blast to meet so many bands that we've been listening to really like our whole lives and also a bunch of new bands that we just found out about this warp tour. So stay tuned through the episode. It's a bit of a long one, but we've got interviews with the Fantastic Plastics, CKY, Silverstein. Bad Cop, Bad Cop, Candiria, Anti-Flag, War on Women, and Guar. That's right, Guar. So stay tuned to the end for that interview. We also asked each band to pronounce Ebor City, which was more hilarious than we expected. So we'll give you a little bit of that too. I also had the opportunity to write an article for Creative Loafing Tampa about our experience at Van's Warp Tour. So you can check that out at cltampa.com. The article is called Five Things We Learned Backstage at Van's Warp Tour. But this will definitely give you some things from backstage because all the interviews took place there for the most part, either backstage or on CKY's bus. We did try something new for this one. The press tent at Warp Tour uh, was not near any power. So we had to try out a little bit of a new setup, a new sort of man on the street type thing. It's not our usual gear. So we did have a couple technical issues and there were also just some issues with the amount of background noise and other things going on at Warp Tour. We did what we could with the audio, but if it's not up to our usual standards, we apologize. If you're listening for the first time, go back and listen to some of the other episodes. That's a, more of an example of our usual quality, but we still think the, these interviews were a lot of fun to do and that you'll enjoy listening. So check it out. So here it is, episode number 41. I'm gonna, gonna tell it, tell it to you. I know what you're going through. I'm gonna, gonna tell it, tell it to you. Think fast, at last. We're through living in the past. I know what you're going through. I'm gonna, gonna tell it, tell it all to you. So we've now transported ourselves to the future. We're hanging with the the amazing, the wonderful, the spectacular, the fantastic plastics. How's it going, guys? It's going great, Randy. So, you know, obviously, I, we do have to give the disclaimer that you are one of our own. You are one of the bands, part of the Cigar City Management family. So this was, it was a little tough to get this interview. You know, we had to clear it from so many people and, you know, make sure that we could get it in the schedule. And it, it was it was hard, but all, we only had to ask ourselves. So that's good. Yeah, I feel like because you are our managers and you're doing the podcast, trying to clear it with yourself could have opened a wormhole. Yeah. yeah. 
and then we would have never gotten out of it. We would it would have been like a Rick and Morty episode where it's like suddenly there's like 50 different versions of ourselves. Exactly. Yeah, that would have been a mess. So this is your first time on Van's Warp Tour. You're on the full sail stage. What's it been like so far? Uh, it's been pretty incredible. Uh, you know, the full sail stage is sort of like the beginners, not the beginner stage, but sort of the lower tier. I, that's not. It's not a very lesser known bands. Lesser maybe. known bands, yeah, yeah. Trying not to make it sound pejorative. But what's cool is uh, this year a lot of the bands are pretty diverse and weird. And uh, so people just sort of come by and then they stick around and the, the crowd builds, you know, as you go. And it's, it's, it's been pretty excellent because pe- no one's expecting to see what we are or what any of the bands are. So you, you, it's, it's a nice surprise for most yeah, people. Yeah, it's been an amazing opportunity. It's the, definitely the biggest thing we've done as a band. And, and we've played in front of crowds we would have never played in front of. Um, you know, we've never been out west or to the south. And so it, it's been amazing. And we definitely want to come back to all those cities, too, on our own. Yeah, it was really great. to You played a little earlier and just watching people stop because they saw what you were doing. They saw the stage show. They, they heard the music and tons of people were just like dead in their tracks. Like, what am I actually seeing? How do I process this? So has that kind of been the reaction? Yeah, yeah. It's been uh, Denver. Denver was, well, never mind Denver, but it was similar to Denver. Yeah, yeah. People just like walk by and they stare and, and you can't, you like think that maybe they're not digging it or they're like not having it. And then at the end, they they come up and talk and they love it they just don't know how to what to make of it right yeah like, yeah we get we get asked a lot of questions afterwards people are usually about the theremin people are like what is that thing and um it's been great i feel like i'm introducing the vans warp tour world to the theremin yeah and you're playing theremin in like attack theremin mode like i see you doing karate chops and and moves and uh, unorthodox method probably but it works for me it works for our music well, I mean, is there a really an orthodox way of theremin? Like, is there a school of theremin? Tyson would probably know about this. Yes, there absolutely is. It's actually like, uh, you can look on YouTube, there's like special finger patterns. Like, so if you're going to play it like a melodic instrument, yeah, there's a very specific way to play it. And it's really hard to play it that way. Yeah, I know. It's it's like, I don't even understand. Me too, but yeah, it's yeah. just a little more spazzy, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> No, it's it's pretty amazing. Yeah. You're you're a full in uniform and yeah, how are you surviving this this Florida heat? The Fantastic Plastics are sponsored by Gold Bond, medicated no. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, we just try to dip in the air conditioning if it exists. Yeah. Like today there's no AC, but some days, you know. At this point we're just used to it. Like pretty much everything we wear is polyester. <laughs> so cuz that's the fu- most futuristic fabric that you could wear, so that's true. That makes sense. Yeah, it's just not breathable in any way. And and I, I think one thing that not everybody knows is that Miranda, you actually make your uniforms custom. You know, you don't. You, this isn't like you don't pre-purchase this online. This is all you. So where did the inspiration behind the design and the aesthetic come from? Well, um, I've always been really inspired by old sci-fi movies, specifically Barbarella. That, that had the most amazing costumes, and it was one of the first sci-fi mu- movies to say, like, this is what we think people are going to dress like in the future. So I think that's definitely the whole retro, futuristic 60s space race, space age vibe is, is my biggest inspiration for sure. Yeah, I think that's kind of the whole thing is it's like kind of a Buck Rogers, like future that never was type thing, yeah. you know, and that's it's like the original Tomorrowland at Disneyland was like that. Yeah, that's a that's a good inspiration as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There, so there will be a great big, beautiful tomorrow for the Fantastic Plastics. Yeah, right? She made like 10 fresh costumes just for this tour so that we'd have like a new one every day because we're just sweating through them, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah, like there's no way you can do. You can do any, and you've been different colors every day, all matching, of course, because she made 10 uniforms. <laughs> The new EP that's out, Invasion. Tell us a little bit about Invasion. Uh, Invasion was uh, sort of picked up where Devolver left off, and and that a couple of them were songs that we felt were good songs but didn't quite fit the aesthetic of Devolver. And so a few of those songs were stuff that were left off of Devolver. And then we're kind of rolling into our new sound, which is like TV Head represents. And that's sort of, you know, disco punk sort of dance dance vibe that's... uh, a beat and just we just basically want people to move while we play you know so we're experimenting you know yeah and i mean people were definitely moving i know you guys were doing the the pogo just jump it down and like i am amazed at you tyson because this is you've been playing day in and day out every day for this warp tour and you're still giving it 100 percent energy jumping around like a maniac like i really don't get it yeah the fantastic plastic sponsored by monster energy <laughs> <laughs> cut the check monster cut yeah. the check yeah 
But for real, yeah. How much yeah. Monster Energy drink have you drank? Uh, I, we drink like one right before we play every day, you know, it and uh, it, it works. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a secret. If you want to rock like the fantastic plastics, just pump yourselves full of energy drink. A lot of water too, though. Yeah. yeah, no, the water isn't. Water isn't. I try to drink like two. It's funny. So on the Vans Warp Tour, they, they give all the bands uh, Monster Tour Water, which looks just like the Monster Energy drink cans, but it says Tour Water. So you got to be careful which one you're drinking. But, you know, we try to drink Slam 2 Tour Waters then an energy drink, and then the rest of the day, just water. Yeah, it seems like a perfectly good yeah, formula. Is that a good formula? Mm -hmm. All right, we'll do it. Yeah. So one of the things that I appreciate about your live show, too, is that you incorporate a lot of sound effects, movie clips, and stuff. Do you feel like the live show tells a little bit of a story, or...? I think it could, yeah. I mean, we've, we've, we've toyed with that idea, uh, but it, it, I think it could. I think someone could just take what's there sort of in an ambient way and make a story out of it, and it's... But when we've tried to like script it out, it's 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 kind of pigeonholes too much. You know what I mean? So we want some flexibility to mix it up. But but yeah, it's definitely there's definitely a thread. You know. So tell us what's what's next? What's on? What's in the future for the band that is the future of the future? Uh, so we're wrapping up Warp Tour tomorrow in West Palm, and then we immediately go into uh, we're going to try to do at least two videos for songs off of Invasion. And we might throw in a third video that's a lot of live footage for Overtime, which is off our old album. And then uh, we are recording our new record and then a tour in the fall. I, I don't know that we'll get our record done before that fall tour, but we're going to try really hard to like, we just want to keep it going. We want to keep the momentum going, you know. And, but either way, I mean, you guys have so much cool merch, not just the shirts and buttons and, and stickers, but also a comic book. Is there going to be another comic book coming along? I think we have to. I just don't, I'm not sure how it's going to be yet, but uh, we probably won't finish the Devolver one. It's kind of funny that it never got finished, maybe 20 years from now, but we'll definitely have to have some kind of tie-in with our new with our new album. Yeah. So if if you if you're into if you're into some weird sci-fi, some fun stuff, the Fantastic Plastics is the band to check out for sure. So uh, any last words for the Cigar City Radio crowd? Sure. Uh, just make sure to check us out online on Facebook and Instagram. We are the Fantastic Plastics, and uh, Snapchat and Twitter. We are at Plastics Band. And if you go to uh, www.thefantasticplastics.com, it'll take you right to our Bandcamp page. And one of these days, we'll sit down and we'll do a, a longer interview with the band. There's so much more that we can dive into. So much more listeners that you haven't heard yet. But yeah, we're an onion. Yeah, but for <laughs> but for now, this is what we got. We only got a few minutes with you guys while you're here. You're just so busy. Well, yeah, we're important. We have a ton of we have a ton of press lined up. Uh, I mean, look at all these people around lining up, waiting to to ask us questions. And we just got to keep it going. We got to rest our voices, you know. You almost lost your voice, right? Yeah, I. It's hanging on there. Well, for one more show, as long as I, it's still there. <laughs> That's all that matters. All right, so we're on the tour bus of the legendary CKY, right? Legendary. Right. You can. I would say you guys are legendary. We were born legendary. <laughs> I think that's a fact. I think most people in my generation probably know you guys from like the Tony Hawk's Pro Skater games and the uh, all your skate videos back in the day. But you've come a long way since then, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks for taking time to uh, talk to us here at the Warp Tour. Today. Yeah, you're doing 41 dates, all all the Warp Tour dates, right? Is there 42? Right. I'm talking about the program. Now 41. It's, it's, it's been 40. It's 39 now. Oh. It's now 39. <laughs> well, yeah, we're doing all the Warp Tour dates, um, and we just got off a long Canadian run and a UK run before that. So, yeah, we're out. We're out here. We out here. And that's you got the new record, The Phoenix, just came out. The Phoenix. Long, long awaited new record. Hell yeah. I mean, so what What brought on the this sort of resurgence of CKY? Um, well, uh, I, w I would say we didn't realize how much time had been passing while we, you know, maybe weren't making CKY records. Before you knew it, it was, uh, I don't know, eight years, wasn't it, Jess? Eight years? So, yeah, I mean, uh, we had a lot of life lessons to learn and growing up to do and um, bettering ourselves be before we could, you know, do anything good for the audience. So now we're feeling good and we feel like, uh, you know, we're on a track feels like the right track and uh you know more cky is here i mean we we got back together and here we are all of a sudden we're, we're back on tour and it's going great man, you know does, does it feel like no time has passed or are you uh starting to feel the the burn of touring nah we had enough time off where it feels great i mean back in the day when we were like 
abusing our bodies more and uh, ingesting wrong substances too often, um, <laughs> things hurt more. Uh, we're just smarter people, man. Times have changed. So, like, these days we're just about, like, doing good shows, sounding great, making sure the music is killer, um, being happy, having a good time, having fun, uh, appreciating things, appreciating CKY, appreciating everybody and, and music in general and uh, just making more music and more records and playing more shows. And that's kind of what we're focused on. So the Phoenix isn't just going to be a one-off thing. There's there going to be more new CKY coming down the line? Yeah, dude. Uh, the Phoenix is just the start of it, man. I mean, there's, there's a lot, a lot already waiting for us to get to as soon as we're done touring and have a minute to start recording some more. And uh, the intention is to do this, you know, as long as we are alive. So that's, that's what's going to happen. At this point, ain't nobody stopping us now. Yeah, I don't think anybody could stop CKY. Yeah. yeah any plans to do more uh, more videos? Uh, it depends what kind of videos you mean. Um, you, what, what kind of videos do you mean? Tell me. Like, are you gonna you you used to have the CKY video series? Right, right. Yeah. Any plans to bring that back? The CKY video series, being a Bam Margera production, Bam uh, does a lot of things. Um, he's always busy. If Bam wants to, you know, focus on on making a CKY movie, that would be up to him. You know, we'd all be totally into doing it and we would supply any type of music or anything we could to help that. But that's a BAM thing. BAM does the CKY movies. Uh, BAM's been busy. He made it uh, a movie. He hasn't released yet. He's still working on it. It's kind of a life's work. Uh, he's just been filming nonstop forever and he's back to skating now. So when he has a minute, I'm sure, uh, you know, it's a possibility. Like I said, as long as we're still alive, we're not giving this up. That's a, that's awesome, man. And it seems like the time for it. I think fans are really engaged. And you know, how's the how are the crowds been here at Warped Tour? The crowds at Warped Tour are are great, man. I mean, the CKY, we really had no idea what to expect. We were kind of gone for a while, um, and uh, we got an experience of what it was like when we went over to the UK, uh, and was met with you know a, a, a great reaction. Was tickets for the UK tour sold out in like you know ten minutes. Um, and that set it off and then we hit Canada and now we here we are at Warp Tour and it's, it's really going better than it has in a long, long time. And uh, it's so cool to see all these new young people into CKY and telling us about how they found out about us and old fans coming. Um, it's a great opportunity for us to play in front of new people who haven't heard the music or haven't seen us live. So it's really been working out great. That's incredible. All right, we are here with Shane from Silverstein. Um, how are you doing, Shane? Fantastic, how are you? I'm good. It's a little hot, but good. We, I think we expected more rain, so I'm it's, glad that it's not too rainy. It's not as bad as yesterday. Yesterday was much hotter, and then the rain came, and it was just ruined everything. Yeah. Yesterday, yesterday sucked, to be honest. Today is much better, and it's, it's a beautiful uh, spot here by the water they do. Yeah, and um, how many warp Tours have you guys done so far? It's our seventh. I actually remember um, the Warp Tour compilation CDs that come out every year. I remember Warp Tour 2004. Uh, I don't know if that was maybe your first, but uh, I remember that was actually my like first real discovery of you guys. I remember 2003, 2004 is about where I was listening to you guys. Yeah, we did. We did one show. It's actually, I guess, technically our eighth Warp Tour because we did one show in 2003 in Boston, but then 2004 was our first. You know, where we did a whole bunch of almost the whole tour. So yeah, that was that was the the start for us, and um, we've kind of been a Warp Tour staple, you know, yeah. ever since pretty much. Great. And is Warp Tour the only tour you guys are doing this year, or are you guys actively on tour? We're always on tour. We've already done a Canadian tour this year. In addition to making a new album, we also went to South America and Mexico just last month. And then after this, we have I'm going to Australia for a little solo tour. And then we're also doing Germany, full German tour of 14 shows, a full UK tour, and uh, also touring Canada again. So we're very busy. Awesome. And with touring, um, since you guys are, like you said, a warp Tour staple, you're always on tour. I remember you guys, like like the emergence of that early 2000s, um, kind of the hardcore, the, the pop punk, the emo, they kind of lump them all together in, in terms of that. But what have you seen over the years in terms of your fan base or the crowds and everything? Are you seeing a substantial change or are you starting to see a little bit of that nostalgia kick in for some of your fans that were younger when they initially were listening to you and now they're older and coming back for more 
Um, to be to be quite honest, um, our fan base seems to stay the same age. We, you know, um, we we keep getting older and they stay the same age. It's 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 funny though. No, like like we did um, the discovering the waterfront ten year anniversary tour. I guess uh, two years ago now, and I thought that the people coming out to that would be, you know, our old fans from ten years ago, and now they would be, if they were. 17, 18 then, they'd be, you know, approaching 30 or some of them in the 30s. There were, like, so many little kids there. And, you know, people, people like 13, 14 coming up to me and saying, oh, you know, this is, like, my favorite album of all time. And I'm like, you know, you were in diapers when it came out. <laughs> and, and so it really is amazing how I think our music has, not only has our, our older music and our, our, you know, our first few records been passed down, from you know, from the older generation to the younger generation, somehow the younger generations discovered it. But our new music tends to be embraced heavily by you know the current music fans, the average Warp Tour attendee. I don't know what their age is, but they tend to you know pick up our new records and and listen to them. So it, it really isn't the case of of oh we can just play play in bars and twenty one and over shows and and all our fans are going to be you know having to get babysitters to uh to come see us play it's really not like that and i, I kind of thought it would be but it's really not yeah i've noticed um that my particular age group um i'm 26 so when we were listening to you we were preteens, teenagers yeah. and stuff and there's a sense of like nostalgia and resurgence in some of the music that we're listening to we're active with new music but i don't know if you're familiar with a thing that is called emo night brooklyn they've been like touring and stuff and that's something that i've noticed the more that that happens every year you're seeing more and more of like my age group go back out pick up these albums again and um you know when broke was easily fixed or discovering the waterfront um you know those were my albums and to revisit them but actually like go and listen to the music today like um uh your new music and everything we're able to listen to it and and kind of tune in and be able to get it i guess better so it's kind of cool to hear that you have a younger crowd coming through and everything. Well, that's a, that's a whole thing too. The whole emo night thing, which originally I was a little bit, I thought it was like kind of lame to be honest. But now that I've seen, uh, I've been to them and, and there's one in Toronto. It's not called emo night. It's called homesick. Shout out to my homesick people. You know, I've DJed it a couple times and it really is just a fun, you know, like, like throwback for the people younger than me. Cause I'm 36 you know them kind of remembering when they were in high school and yeah. the bands they listened to and still I guess still listen to um, and for me it, it kind of brings me back to that era of when we were first starting out and you know riding around in a van and just being you know dumb kids getting crazy so I kind of like it you know in that in that respect and in terms of like what it's done for the scene and stuff I, I think you're right in that like it, it has there has been a resurgence of that. And I'm sure people go to these things and my heroine or smile in your sleep or smash to pieces or whatever song they might play at the emo night, you know, people are like, Oh yeah, this is like, I haven't heard this song in a while. Maybe it's still a great song. You know, I'll go listen to it on Spotify when they get home, you know, all those things, you know, or, or I'll go see the band when they come through. I think it all helps, you know, we embrace everything. That's awesome. I've always enjoyed your music and it's definitely helped me out as I've grown older. And the more that I listen to it, the more that I actually can get in tune with it and understand it. And I know um, your 2015 album, you guys have mentioned that you felt it was your most honest album. But as I revisit all of your career, go through it and everything, I can kind of see that there is that build of honesty and everything. So it's kind of cool to be able to touch back on the earlier days, see where you were at, and then actually still have an, an honest approach to things. Yeah, no, I think, um, you know, very early on lyrically, uh, well, I should go back even further than that. When I first started writing lyrics, you know, for Silverstein, um, you know, I decided they were going to be personal and they were going to be emotional and it was going to be about my feelings, you know, like when I was younger, I was like in punk bands and stuff and I was writing like stuff about like like government and like you know I was getting political and I mean I'm like 14 what the fuck do I know but like you know that that was kind of what I was trying to do and then you know you get a little older and had my heart broken a few times a teenage you know teenage heartbreak and that's what I started writing about but you know 
when I did that at first, I was very uh, like, I, I didn't want to show anybody what I wrote. You know, I wrote it down and I'd sing it, but like, this was just like shows, like live. Some of it was screaming. People couldn't really understand it. So finally, when like it came time to make a record and I had these lyrics out there, they were very honest and very real to me. And I was sort of like, ah, I'm not like a bit, you know, had some hesitation about putting it out. And, you know, when we get signed and everything, then like we sell hundreds of thousands of records, like these people are t telling me, oh, I relate to your words so much because they're honest. So I was like, man, like, I don't know if I like, if I like this, if I like putting myself out there with, you know, my real thoughts and feelings. And then when it came time to do um, album number two, I started writing, I was like, I, I like I, everything I wrote like sucked because it wasn't real. I like, yeah. you know, I couldn't put it out there. And then s at some point I just wrote something and I loved it. And I was like, I have to just let this go. And I have to put this out because other people, you know, I felt like kids are counting on me now. You know, I need to, to talk real and honestly and, and candidly about it. And um, that's pretty much what I've done ever since that moment. I realized that I was like, I can't censor myself. I can't not say what I'm feeling or dumb it down. And I've always done that. Yeah. Well, it's, it's definitely great. And as a active listener, we appreciate it. So thank you for always remaining honest. As we had mentioned before, you are a staple of Warp Tour. So what would you say to some of the younger bands coming in and just starting off or maybe experiencing their first Warp Tour? What kind of advice would you give them to? You got to you gotta get the hang going. I'm looking around, all these buses around. Um, you can hear the rumble of the buses or maybe you can't hear the rumble of the buses <laughs> with some pro audio editing. Behind the tents, you know, You'll see some people with tents and they'll have some chairs set up, which is fine. But like, we go harder than that. We got AstroTurf on our like trailer deck, which we invented, by the way, the propped up trailer. You can see, we invented that. And um, yeah, we got multiple tents. We've got little white picket fences. We have live plants this year. Uh, we have a barbecue, obviously. Uh, we're just hanging hard all summer long and that's what keeps us you know, keeps the PMA up. Yeah. And you need that in Warp Tour because, believe me, it's very easy to have the PMA uh, torn down quickly, especially when it's like 100 degrees and like about to piss rain, which I think the storm's gonna pass us, but <laughs> you never know, it's coming and it can really be a, a bit of a life ruiner. So I think the younger bands, they just the hang, their hang game is really lacking. So yeah. hang, bump up the hang. Step it up, young bands. Yeah. All right, so we're here, our first interview today at Vans Warped Tour in St. Pete with Jenny from Bad Cop, Bad Cop, one of my favorite bands on the tour, actually, Whoa. believe it or not. How are you enjoying Warped Tour so far? Oh, it's really fun and exciting and challenging and new every day. It is new every day. Yeah. yeah. We have a band that's on the tour as well, and they're like, every day is like a whole new adventure. It's, it's like It's kind of fun. You know yeah. what I mean? It's kind of like no, a it's carnival. Of fun. It's it kind of like carnival. Yeah. It yeah. is exactly like carnival. Are you guys running around and just putting your posters up on uh, on porta potties yes. and making sure people come to so the so someone will see it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> totally. The porta potties are one of the places you can guarantee yeah. somebody's going to see it, right? We, our tactic mostly has been like accosting people in line with stickers. You know, do you have this free sticker? It goes with your shirt. I promise. Like, so. Yeah. Yeah. Working. Yeah, totally. <laughs> so one of the cool things I love about Bad Cop, Bad Cop is like you're bringing up a lot of uh, great social issues, you know, female empowerment issues. But you're doing it in a way where it's like the songs are super catchy and fun. Like contrast with like another band on World Tour, War on Women, who are love uh, totally awesome, but in a different kind of way. So yeah. How yeah. do you juxtapose that mix of like you're making poppy music but you're sending a real message? Um, First of all, thank you. Um, we really thought about how we were going to do this with our new record because we were like, we had just toured the country and then came home and wrote this record. And it was like everything that wasn't important kind of got sloughed off. And then it was, you know what I mean? You get like 10 to 12 golden arrows to fire. Like they should all be meaningful, right? Yeah. So, uh, and then we, we had a lot of conversations within the band about like what position we want to inspire these from you know like um and the open hand feminism of like maybe you don't know about this and we want you to know that it is a warm wonderful place to 
and have it together. Like, yeah. uh, we really wanted that to be kind of the platform where it's like, it's fun, it's powerful, it's for everybody, it's not scary. You shouldn't feel ashamed of something that you didn't know because I, I we do think that if people know enough, they would make the right decision. You know what I mean? Yeah, you like to generally assume that people are good-hearted. Yeah. Right? I mean, I think sometimes we're wrong about that, given yeah. the president that we have. But. You know, even then, <laughs> even then, it's kind of like, what didn't you get as yeah. a child? You know what I mean, Mr. President? Obviously, nobody really taught you how to look after other people or care about other people, and that makes sense because you're like obscenely rich and probably a nanny look after you and not a parent or like a loved one you know what I mean no sympathy for the president but still it's just kind of like I I do think if people have what they need and they have enough education and resources they can make really the right decisions yeah I think that makes sense so what message do you have I know there's work towards a younger crowd there's a lot of teens and tweens out here there's parents and what message do you have for the future generation um you are more powerful than you think and you can respect everyone and yourself. There's room for all of that in the world. That's a great message. So we are here with Carly and John from Candiria, a metal band from Brooklyn, New York, which isn't something you see all the time. I mean, what's the what's the metal scene like in Brooklyn? Uh, right now, it's really strong. Uh, there's a really great metal scene. Uh, there's a couple of really great venues in New York right now. There's St. Vitus Bar, uh, Lucky 13 Saloon, um, there's Sunnyvale, there's there's so many, there's Brooklyn Steel, and it's just a great vibrant scene right now. Uh, there's some really key players in, in New York City right now, guys like Frank Godla from Metal Injection, and like I said, the, the venues that make the scene really healthy, and they welcome national acts, but they also put local bands on the bill. So the Brooklyn metal hardcore punk scene, the underground music scene, aggressive music scene is really strong right now. That's dope. Like we actually manage a couple bands in Brooklyn, but more on like the psychedelic rock, right, like kind of right, DIY, sure, sure, like sure. bands that were playing at uh, Shea Stadium all the time yeah, back when it was around. Yeah. But so we we spend a lot of time in the Brooklyn scene. But cool, St. Cool. Vitus is one of my favorite spots. Yeah, yep. But you guys have been doing this for a long time, though, right? So yeah. kind of have you? What's how has the scene changed over the years? How have things? Uh, uh, well, I know that one of the, when we first started, that's a big mic. Anyway, when we first, <laughs> when we first started, um, the hardcore scene was really, well, de- the death metal scene, but then it really evolved into the hardcore scene was just really big, really vibrant. Bands like VOD, you had bands like um, Crown of Thorns, Scarhead, and it was just one huge, um, just in a sense, like, I'll you dare say even one huge party. Everyone's at CB's, everyone's at Coney Island High, whatever. And, uh, and that died down for like a little bit. It's really true. Continental closed. Yeah. You know, and once again, it goes back to the point that when you have really good venues that are supporting a music scene, yeah. if you build it, they will come. That's yeah. the bottom line. What? He just dropped the bo- dropped the mic right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I know you guys have described yourselves as like metal urban fusion. Yeah. And, and I think you're one of the bands that can truly t- yeah. like hold the fusion flag, the mixing kind of jazz elements, hip hop elements. Is that, I mean, where did that style come from? The style came from growing up in New York, right? And like you could hop on the train or walk a couple blocks. Uh, you, you'll end up in like uh, mostly like Asian area. You can pick up some like, you know, Chinese food, whatever, Japanese food, walk a few blocks down, Caribbean area, whatever. And like, it's like everything melted, melted into one. And so that to me plays into our music, you know, our culture. Let's try this, let's try that. You know what I mean? And um, so the same goes for our music. Oh, I never thought about mixing that together. I'm really into hip hop this year. Let me try mixing that into a metal, uh, a metal riff followed by a jazz part. And that's when Candira started. That's what we started doing. We started um, uh, mixing together just the genres of music that we loved. And uh, we considered ourselves and still consider ourselves like musical scientists, alchemists, whatever, astronauts, just try to go where, um, try to go beyond where we, um, beyond our comfort zone, so to speak. Yeah, and I, that's something I really appreciate listening to your records because you can really hear. I, there's not a lot of bands where you can go from death metal to you know a jazz section, and then you got some you know crazy solos or something like. It really is a melting pot of music. I guess yeah, the way the city is. Yeah. There was just one song on our first record, and correct me if I'm wrong, right? Where we put a we hooked up a microphone inside of a car to get the horn. Then we had a a gate going up and down, and we. And we had the pit bull going off in the background, and that became a song. 
on the record. Yeah. So that's yeah. like some true experimental sampling. You know, look, you know, New York City, it's, it's, it's such a vibrant city as far as like sound goes. You know, you get on the train, like he was saying, you know, you jump on the train and you go to a different neighborhood, you get out of the train, you step out of Broadway Lafayette, there's a saxophone player at the station with a tip jar out and he's just practicing scales. So you're hearing, you're hearing jazz and you walk a couple blocks down and there's an Indian restaurant and you hear a tabla player and a sitar player. Yeah. It's really hard to grow up in those environments and not, if you're a musician, to not notice or not take, not yeah. be affected by it yeah. or inspired by it or take interest in it and that's really the thing i think the thing was we took interest in it we took interest in all of it we were we were excited about different styles of music and uh once once we started incorporating different styles of music into into one song it just became so like carly said it became this thing like this is what we're gonna do this is something that feels natural to us we're not gonna force it but we're gonna we're gonna this is the thing that we're gonna we're gonna keep trying to do we're gonna keep experimenting with these things that's it i mean like pretty much just do what we want and like uh, really not take into, into consideration what other people would think. It's just really just being honest. This is where we are. This is what we want to do. We weren't really thinking about the money. We we're thinking about pushing the boundaries. And the funny thing is, uh, now looking back at all that, I, I, I notice or I recognize now how much being in Candira has even affected my life personally where it's like, I want to stay out of my comfort zone. I'm like, well, why can't I do that? Or why can't I do this? Or, and, or when I'm like talking to people and just trying to push them in a certain direction, help them in a certain direction, I'm like, well, who says, well, why can't you do it? The word impossible doesn't exist in our vocabulary. And that's one of the things that I've taken away, that I've taken um, away from most by being in this band, yeah. And that's awesome. And then I was just going to ask you too, because it's like, you know, you look around, like there's not a lot of black people here. There's not a lot of black people in the hardcore heavy music scene. Yeah. So how do you feel being, you know, a black man in this scene? Like, yeah, I, well, I definitely noticed that there's a lot more than there was years ago. Um, um, but what it does for me personally, it makes me put on a better show. Uh, the same way when Eminem came out on the hip hop scene, he had to do a little more than the other uh, MCs that were out there to show that he wasn't a gimmick. So, so what it's done for me, it's just pushed me to work harder to show that like, all right, uh, I can do this and uh, I'm, I'm going to put my stamp on it. I'm going to uh, have my, my upbringing be part of that. And it's, and because of who I am, because of where I've grew up, it's going to add a little more diversity to it. And I'm going to do it different from the, the typical, let's say guys singing in a metal band, you know? Yeah. And I think that's awesome. And I think, I think you know, I'll say, you don't have to say it, but I feel like you are a good inspiration for a lot of black youth that, you know, you can do whatever you want. If that if this is your style, you don't have to it's fit what, a certain mold. Living Color did for me. I remember sitting down, just watching, like, I grew up listening to, couldn't afford, like, MTV, all that stuff. So I would listen to, watch this one station called U68, and all they would play is metal. I'm like, man, this stuff sucks, but I love music. This is all I can watch. So I would just sit there watching, like, Grim Reaper, watching Iron made in Motley Crue, Metallica. And after a while, I'm like, oh, I gotta tell you, it's not bad. And then, <laughs> and then next thing you know, I started understanding it. And it became the, even though I grew up listening to hip hop, Michael Jackson, like soul, Motown, all that stuff. But metal be and hard rock became the vehicle that I wanted to express myself in because I spent so much time just watching a lot of metal videos. And, uh, um, and, and so the way, so one day I was watching Living Color, I saw them on Channel 4 and The Tonight Show, I'm like, wow, like I can do this. And, and much to my surprise, more than just influencing, let's say, someone of color, I find myself influencing a lot of white dudes too. So, and uh, I kind of want to do, what, what I'm starting to realize is the same way that uh, Michael Jackson transcended race, I would like to think, of course, representing like, you know, my people, like, listen, this is, this, we can, you don't have to be ashamed of liking metal because, you know, back in the day, like, you're like, you like metal? Whoa! You know, that's that devil music, right? Whatever. But like, I kind of just want to just beyond that. It's just, listen, here's something that I'm doing. I'm experimenting. You can do this too, regardless of the color, you know? Well, that's great. And I think that's definitely something that you can yeah. take out of the band yeah. in general. Just as a listener, you know that this Candiria is about freedom of expression, yeah. you know, which is great. Yeah, so most recent record, While They Were Sleeping, yeah. all right, came out last year. You got anything else coming up on the horizon or... Uh, at the moment, uh, right now, we're just touring to support the album. Um, we definitely want to do. We, we definitely want to reconnect because we've been gone for, for for some time. 
we definitely want to reconnect with fans and uh, get back out on the road a bit and support it. We really do love the record, and uh, we want to make sure we do everything that uh, we can before we jump in and start writing again. But we do, we're excited to get uh, into the, st in eventually get into the studio again because, you know, while they were sleeping is a concept album. Lyric, there's a lyrical concept that Carly came up with at the at the beginning stages of our writing process for this album, and uh, we're excited to see where it goes. I'm excited to see where it goes because he wrote it. I don't know what's what's happening next. Oh, you know? It's getting juicy. <laughs> I have a couple of things lined up, uh, and. Uh, and I, I, when I when I was writing that story, it was like a year in the making. Pretty much just, I would watch a lot of news, see what's going on there, watch what was going on in my personal life, the personal lives uh, of my friends. And I just was like, inspired by literally everything. Everything was something, I would go in, in one direction, then I would see something and like, I'm like, huh, that would be cool. What if this happened? And it would just completely shift the story into another direction. And that's the great thing about it, because even I, for the most part, don't know where it's going to go. But I, one thing I know for certain is I want the story to uh, escalate. You know what I mean? Just uh, like just increase, like just in terms of turmoil, push, pull, good, evil, all that stuff. You know, that's that's kick ass. Yeah. Man. And I can't wait. To, I can't wait to hear where it goes. All right, so we're hanging out here with Pat from Anti-Flag. Or is it Anti-Flag? Where's the accent? I say Anti-Flag, but uh, a lot of people say Anti-Flag. Yeah, I think it's just where you're from, right? How you it's where you're from. <laughs> that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it, is it anti-aircraft or anti-aircraft? That's, you know, that's, that's the question. Yeah. So this is interesting because this is actually the second time you're on our podcast. Okay. Believe it or not, because uh, we interviewed Real Big Fish in town in Tampa. Yes. At, uh, the, the Ritz, and you guys were sound checking during our interview uh, so we had to spend a lot of time yeah. removing <laughs> your backgrounds Re now. removing our awesome jams from your real big fish interview <laughs> yeah exactly but, but i'm glad we finally got to actually sit down and, and chat with yeah. you so that's really cool the interesting thing about what anti-flag does is that we find the nuance in the stupidity and the uh, and the shitty parts of policy and of life of powerful people and with people like Trump, um, everybody sees how stupid he is. So there's not a whole lot of interesting things to comment. Everybody knows he's a racist and sort of what it is. Um, everybody knows that he's completely an egomaniac and has no concept of anybody else but himself. So there's very, it's, it takes a lot of energy actually to find something interesting to say about him because he's such a dick. Yeah, that's kind of a similar approach to like Trey Parker and Matt Stone took from South Park. They yeah. were like, look like we what what the fuck do we want to say like, yeah. there's nothing else for us to say this is literally more comedic than anything yeah. we'd write yeah, yeah, exactly like, you know there's nothing yeah there's not you, sure yeah he's just an asshole and you know, that's not interesting to just say he's an asshole yeah so um yeah exactly we're all struggling to find um interesting things to say um about him you know one of the things i really respect about your band too is even when you you know hit your hit your label your major label days on rca records you never led up to that viewpoint you know no and actually it was uh, it was actually fun on the major label because they were afraid of us and didn't know what to do so they kept giving us money to do ridiculous things <laughs> and make amazing statements so yeah um yeah we had the access of a major international corporation to talk about you know anti-violence and and uh, military recruitment in schools and all kinds of amazing things and it's much harder when you don't have that money behind you to get these statements out as you said you yeah. haven't been paying attention yeah. <laughs> no, if you're on the major you would have known, yeah, known. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 known all about the interesting things that we're doing all right so we are here with shauna from war on women at warp tour how are you doing today oh i'm doing very well thank you uh, kind of nice that it's not as rainy as the other dates, as I've heard. So are you enjoying a little bit of sunlight? Oh, yeah, way better. Um, just a classic little tiny Florida rain shower, and then it was over. It was refreshing, if anything, actually. Yeah, yeah. And um, so I know you guys are pretty familiar with Florida. I actually caught you guys at uh, Prefest in October. Uh, it was actually my first live exposure of you guys. And uh, when I tell you that my life was changed, my life was changed. That was one of the best like live shows I've seen. So uh, do, you, do you like Florida? Have you guys stopped by quite often? Or is it just more of a recent tour that you guys have done? Yeah, no, I feel like we've actually come to Florida a lot. Um, we're from Baltimore. So East Coast, you know, represent. And uh, it's just kind of easy to go straight down from, from Baltimore and then up a little bit too. But 
So we've played Florida with Propagandi and Flag and then the Fest shows and um, Government Issue. Uh, the last few years have been more Florida heavy than I would have assumed, but things just work out that way and I, that's fine with me. So music stuff aside, um, I mean, you guys, you guys are considered a hardcore punk feminist band. And so bringing up the fact that you've been to Florida often, this is a red state. And uh, so my question is, especially in this political climate, have you seen um, a better reception in terms of crowds receiving your message better? Are you seeing more opposition? Or is there any resistance or has there been a change in terms of especially places like this that maybe are against some of the issues that you guys fight hard for each night? Well, I think there's something, you know, incredible about Warp Tour in general, where obviously not everyone that attends is going to be homogenic or whatever the word is, you know, homogenous. Um, like, no, not everyone that's going to attend is exactly the same. Um, but in general, people are coming here to just have some fun, watch some music, be outside, maybe have a beer, you know, or expose, you know, their kids to live music for the first time. Like, they're not coming here to be um, aggressive or um, shitty, I guess. Uh, so really, what I've seen most of is, one, people that already know us and are excited to watch us play and sing along. Maybe they haven't seen us before. Maybe they have. And then people that are have heard of us but have never actually heard us and are watching for the first time or they're walking by and they're, like, maybe surprised and what's going on and they want to check it out but no no one's been um uh no one's held up a protest sign during our set but i guarantee if they did i would absolutely treat them with respect of course of course i uh i wouldn't doubt that from you guys um but as you mentioned warp tour kind of creates like a safe space for everyone because everyone's here for kind of the same reason and there shouldn't really be any any reason for uh, aggression and i know that's something that you guys like to make happen at your shows is um you know the girls to the front is a part of this whole movement but it's not just girls you guys are you know helping queer uh, members of your crowd come through transgender everybody and it's one of those things where it's like if you're hyper masculine or if you're just a guy in general step back make some space and so it's kind of nice to actually come to a spot that helps you provide that and then assist you in that in that motion so do you guys see that when you're at your own shows is is the crowd pretty receptive to that request from you guys yeah i, I don't say it on the mic every time but i certainly think that i you know i'd like to assume that most people understand that you know hey this might not be for you if you're just a cisgendered guy. Like, I hope you enjoy it. I hope everyone enjoys the music, honestly. I hope everyone learns something. But, you know, it, it was written from my perspective, which you can't share because we've just lived different lives. So I, I do hope that um, the people that might share my perspective or, or have experienced harassment and oppression, too, you know, I hope they feel comfortable enough to take up some space. Because it's not just about, you know, the dudes stepping back a little bit you also have to own and accept that maybe you can as a femme you take up more space and so it's like we're we need to work together on it which i think is sort of represented with the makeup of the band you know the band is not all women um i think a mixed gendered you know feminist future is absolutely necessary um we we have to work together on it and um and really the point is just that everyone have equal access to dancing and moshing and having fun and you know and i said aggression earlier and aggression is aggression isn't necessarily bad um what's bad is harassment and violence and oppression which is different of course and um as we mentioned the political climate is is much different than than we've seen in, in recent years and everything and actually when i saw you guys it was prior to the election so uh, and it was October, so it was a couple, of, it was, I think, a week or two from the election. So um, you... We were so, we were so dumb back then. We really thought he wouldn't get elected. I know, I know. We were confident. We were all screaming and chanting with you, and we, we were mistaken. Um, but my question is, um, as you said, you're a co-ed feminist band, so you have the opportunity to show that there's different perspectives in feminism, which I think a lot of people have this negative mentality and, and reputation and connotation when they hear the word feminist. They, they're assuming it's bra burning. They're assuming it's hate, hating men and everything. So what do you think is key for somebody in a position that can spread messages like you guys are doing to help show that it is extremely inclusive and how can we as a society make feminism inclusive? Uh, well, first of all, people, especially white people like me, have to work 
uh, really hard and make sure that we are inclusive when we talk about feminist issues and that we're not just talking about white women the whole time because that's such a small portion of the world's population, you know? Um, so it's important for us as feminists to be inclusive and then we can present that out and, you know, like, you know, it frustrates me when people think that feminism is about man-hating because it's like the reason you think that is because your whole system is based on hating women. Of course you think that's what we want to do because that's what you're doing to us. It speaks way more about what you're doing than what we're trying to achieve. So I think just stressing the fact that, you know, Webster's Dictionary defines feminism as equality amongst genders. Like, if you just fucking read the dictionary, you'll figure it out what it means, you know? And so, like, oh, are we a little angry sometimes? Like, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm fucking angry because I'm tired of being harassed or groped or being afraid to be harassed or groped when I enter public space. And, like, I just want to live my life and be left alone. You know, so I think the, the key thing is for people that have any power or especially, you know, when we're talking about oppression of women, it's key that men with power uh, talk to other men. Because unfortunately, people listen to people that look like them first. They're not going to listen to the oppressed group. Hey, I want some rights because otherwise if they did, we would be done because we've been saying this for hundreds of years. Right. Uh, so we need men to step up and to actually consistently every time say dude that's not cool or or whatever or support safer scenes or like specifically only buy media that's made by women or people of color women of color trans folks you know like where are you spending money on your books and movies and and music like actually support the people that are part of these groups that are doing something and saying something and stop fucking giving money to white dudes I agree wholeheartedly. <laughs> um, so what is, uh, what's in the forefront for War on Women? You guys uh, got any new music plans? You guys just touring? Um, I mean, are you, are you guys being fueled right now by what's going on? I mean, every day is uh, another song that you guys could write. I mean, every headline is another title or another <laughs> lyric. So are you guys staying busy? We are, we're working on a new record. Um, I, I joke all the time that if, you know, if sexism went away, we wouldn't have to be a band. Like, if you don't like our band, like, stop being sexist and we'll stop. I'd be happy to. I just want to go to work and pay the rent, you know? Like, I don't have to do this, but, but we can't because sexism's still here. But, uh, no, honestly, since the election, I feel like every day I've just been trying to participate in self-care. I have not felt on a personal level uh, emboldened or, you know, using my anger uh, or able to help others, you know, and which I think people look to you when you're in a band, they, 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 look, they look to you a little bit and they look to you for a little inspiration or validation or just an angry workout or something, you know, like whatever you need the music for. Uh, and I'm really, so I'm actually really, really glad that our last record came out a year or two ago. It's given people a chance to find it if they want it and it, they have something to be angry with because I, like, I literally have not been able to be there for anyone right now. So I've been trying to write these new songs and I, I'm like, you know, thinking like, aren't we obligated to write every single song about Trump? But it's like, I don't want to, like, I can't bring myself to do that. And it's just a really interesting place to be creatively when you feel like one, you can't look at his face without feeling nauseous, you know, but then you're in this position where you need to talk about this stuff. So I hope that I, I hope that I talk about some stuff on the new record that is still, you know, important to people or, you know, says something. Um, but it, it should be out next year is the hope, 2018. Right on. Well, um, I hope that uh, sexism goes away for the sake of everything, but I hope you guys never do because uh, great music. I, I appreciate it. It is something that, like, you can go to at any time of the day, any time of the week, whenever, revisit, and kind of put yourself into the perspective because it is really hard right now. It's hard to engage without feeling unsafe or or uncertain you know you don't know and especially as a woman regardless of of race it's it's very hard right now and the the fact that you are called war on women i feel like right now we are in the truest war on women so um so i, I appreciate it so keep doing what you guys are doing i i hope you guys uh i hope i catch you guys you know later tonight and uh when you guys come through florida for your many Many stops. Uh, we'll be here to root you guys on. All right, Cigar City Radio listeners, this is the moment that you've been waiting for. We are with our lords and masters, Guar. 
Yeah, Cigar City. So did you guys bring me a bunch of Cigar City beer for this one? No, we did not. We did not. Those are our homies, though. Oh, okay. Well, I guess I'll do this one dry. I, I figured you would have brought your own. I figured you would have been, you would have brought some, some like, space beer for us. Well, see, we're, we're so rich and we're, we have so much perks that we fly to every show in a bat ship. And for some reason, uh, the TSA or whatever wouldn't let me take a 12-pack as a carry-on. Which I don't, I don't agree with because I wouldn't even last through takeoff. My normal limit is like 72 beers before we play and then another 36 afterwards. So, I mean, it's not a big deal. What, what happens to the, to the crew if they don't supply you the, the proper amount of beer? Oh, well, that's, that's even fun. We just throw a wild card in there and then I just go in other bands' dressing rooms and take their beer. It's fine. I like, I like doing those kind of covert actions throughout the tour. You're probably a little hard, a uh, little hard to miss, though, right? I mean, are you really that stealthy? Uh, not really, but nobody really questions it. I think they're afraid. You know, when you take the severed heads of your last couple of victims with you, you just kind of put them on poles outside of other people's buses. They know not to mess with you. Yeah, it's a warning sign to everyone out there to not fuck with Guar. Of course, yeah. Nobody fucks with Guar anyway. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, who, who was the last person that tried to fuck with Guar? I don't know, Donald Trump. And we killed him last night, so it didn't work out good for him. You've killed a lot of people on stage. I mean, who, Donald Trump is just the latest of many victims. Who's your, your favorite victim? Well, Donald Trump has to be my favorite victim that we've killed so far. And I think it's a testament to the American healthcare system that you guys all need to be aware of because he's coming back every night just like nothing ever happened. So I doubt he has the same health care plan he's pitching everybody else. <laughs> he's, on, he's on some super secret rich person health care plan that none of us get, right? Yeah, nobody, no, no, none of us get it yet. No, not yet. Not so sure we're Canadians. <laughs> is that what's coming next? I don't know. I would hope so. I hope maybe they stage like a coup and Canada just takes us over and I doubt anybody would complain. They'd be really friendly about it. They'd probably ask permission to take over our country. Yeah, we just talked to some Canadians and they were really friendly. They are really friendly. So you don't you don't victimize Canadians then? Oh, we still victimize friendly people. It doesn't that doesn't make a difference. It doesn't, it doesn't make a difference if they're friendly or an asshole. They're still going to get down by Guar. Oh yeah, Guar has an, a complete abhorrence for all of humanity as it stands. There's no way anybody's slipping through the cracks, you know, unless they give us crack. It's literally an unstoppable force. So one of my favorite things that you guys do is the Guar barbecue. So wh where did that idea come from? Uh, well, the barbecue started as like a little backyard party. Oh, look, here comes Blothar the Berserker. But uh, barbecue started as like a uh, backyard party kind of just for us. And, you know, we, 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 we didn't used to invite anybody. It was just us. We would play. We'd actually watch ourselves play, which is another thing that other bands can't do. You know, you can't perform and sit in the audience at the same time. But Guar is just that special. Um, so eventually we decided to open it to the public and have more people come. And uh, it's, it, it all works itself out. People pay to get into the barbecue. Nobody leaves. We chop them up for barbecue and feed them to the next year's crowd. You know, the meat might go a little off, might be a little rotten after a year, but we put enough barbecue sauce on it, nobody notices a difference. I would say a year of marinating in barbecue sauce would be pretty delicious. Yeah, and there's, there's enough booze in the sauce that nothing has a chance to deteriorate anyway bacteria can't live in that froth more of guar is starting to appear i'm getting a little nervous uh, did you have did you have something to add yeah, just fuck you in general you do, do you have a question for me no i don't have any questions i'm too scared to even ask a question right now who's that on your shirt this is bill murray oh of course it is oh. does guar fuck with bill murray no i mean bill you know we we share with bill murray the honor of being in the national lampoon uh, Hall of Fame, so you know, yeah, you know. Uh, it, so my introduction to Guar as a young kid was the uh, movie Empire Records. That scene where you know one of the characters from the movies be basically becomes a member of Guar. It seems. Where did that come from? That came from bad editing. No human would ever be a member of Guar. We would not allow such such travesties to unfold before us. That's disgusting. So, uh, during your Warp Tour takeover, you announced new album, The Blood of the Gods. What, tell us a little bit about what we can expect from that record. The Blood of Gods, available October 20th on Metal Blade Records. All rights reserved, Guar, Slate Pit Incorporated. Um, what you can expect from the record, you can expect disappointment, frustration, anger, hatred, all those, 
all the most common emotions with the new record. You know, I, I pretty much hope that nobody likes it. I like it. That's all I care about, really. And uh, I've already bought my own copy before it's out. They don't just give you one? What? You get records that you make for free? I don't know. I just talked to Metal Blade about that. <laughs> yeah, if you're not buying your record, who's buying it? We had to do the Warp Tour so I could afford the pre-sale for our own record. That's what I've been using my pay for. Are you telling me that record labels give these out to the bands for free? Exactly right. If we're not buying the record, then who is? So Warp Tour, you know, it's definitely a younger crowd here. How are the young kids responding to Guar? Do they even understand what's going on? They should be afraid, and most of them are. I mean, we try, you know, I am required by law to inform people that I am a sexual predator. So I do this on stage, ask them to check, you know, take a hundred, st step back a hundred feet. You know, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But legally, that's what you're required to do. Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's bad. Every time we move into it, we get evicted from our apartments all the time, and we have to go door to door telling everybody that we're moving in. It's a big hassle, but you know. Law is law, right? Then they, I don't think legally they can deny you residence as, you know, being international heroes, right? They can't, can they really even deny you? We're really illegal aliens. I don't know. So you haven't been recognized as heroes? I wouldn't quite use. Heroes would not be the word I would use. No. Yeah, villain is more like it. Um, burden to society. Um, well, you know, the kids react to Guar uh, so far on this warp tour the way they react to everything. They cry because it's a bunch of emo kids out there. They're constantly crying. That's all I see is tears, haircuts, weird fucking clothes. That's all I see. Tears, haircuts, weird fucking clothes. Sounds like the greatest emo album ever. Yeah, it's an ocean of acne and unspecific blase bullshit. In the immortal words of Principal Skinner from The Simpsons, am I out of touch? No, it's the children that are wrong. That's right. We've been asking every band to just shout out where we're from, but we're not going to tell you how to pronounce it. So who wants to go first? I'll do it. Yeah. Ybor City. Yabor City. <laughs> Ybor City. Why <laughs> Ybor City? <laughs> I know Ybor City. Come on. I listen to the, I listen to the hold steady, the roots baby. Yeah, I did. Is it Ybor or Ebor? Because we played little e, little Ebor. Yeah, pre fest and little okay. Ebor. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Ebor, like Igor. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Ebor like Igor. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> All right, that's it. Ebor City. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Yeah. Have you been there? Ebor City. Okay. Yeah, I'm not a fucking city. moron. I've been here. Is that how you say it? <laughs> yeah. Ebor City. You've been to Ebor before, right? Yeah, the, the prostitution here is great. So here's your fade out from the EP Invasion. This is Clockwork by the Fantastic Plastics. <laughs> 